Okay, so thank you for inviting me. Um, so the main topic of the title of the meeting today is the relation is cognition and behavior. And uh, I am a psychologist, and in the domain of psychology, people have different perspectives on what is controlling the behavior, what is the function of cognition in this system, and what is the relation between cognition and behavior. For instance, as a psychologist, you can be a behaviorist. Oops, you can be a behaviorist. And if you are a behaviorist, you will probably consider that the most controlling factor is in fact the outcome of a behavior, the consequence of a behavior. So this is an old idea in psychology. It has been promoted a long time ago by Van Dijk first, by the end of the 19th century, and then by Skinner a lot and the followers. And they made wonderful experiments just to show that the frequency of a given behavior will depend on how you deliver the food, how you provide the reward. So for instance, if you train a rat just to press a lever, then the speed of learning or maybe the frequency of the behavior once the animal has learned will depend on how you provide the food and the, what Skinner called the schedule of reinforcement. But you can have a different perspective and now believe that, uh, okay, what is controlling the behavior is the cognitive system. So there are some really famous classical studies on that. For instance, the studies by Thorman uh, on a cognitive map. And he did some, again, wonderful experiment where he just placed a rat in a maze like this one. So this is a very simple maze. There is a sim single pathway here leading to a food. And when the animal has learned this maze, it's tra it is transferred to this kind of maze with many different pathways. And Tolman was looking at what was the preference for pathways for, for, for the rats. And the rat had this preference here. That means that he preferred to go on this pathway because he goes to the exact same x, y uh, location as for the food in the first maze. So now the idea is that what is controlling the behavior is a cognitive representation, in that case, of a space. But you can even have an even broader perspective and now consider that the controlling factor might be, I don't know, some ec ecological factor, social factor, evolutionary factors. And a good example of that might be, for instance, the theory proposed by Ron Ronbar, Robin Dunbar. And he proposed the social brain hypothesis. And now the idea is that, okay, the main function of a behavior, the main function of a behavior is to solve ecological problems. When you are, I don't know, a baboon, when you live in a field, you have many ecological problems, so you have to adapt your behavior to solve these ecological problems. And Dunbar argued that non-human primates have developed a unique way to solve this problem, which is to expand the sociality, and that the sociality poses some, some problems, raises some problems to animals, because then he has to develop some special cognitive abilities to, to, to solve these social problems, and also to uh, he had to expand the, the brain also to solve these problems. And in support of that, Dumbart proposed this kind of idea, this kind of result. So what you have on this graph is uh, each dot corresponds to a species of primates. What you have here is the group size for these primates. And here what you have is the size of a neocortex relative to the brain. And in support of this, its, its theory, uh, he proposed that when you live in a large group, you will have a larger neocortex ratio on average. Okay, so very clearly people have different perspectives on the relation between cognition and behavior. So some focus on the most proximate aspect of a behavior, some focus on the most ultimate aspect of a behavior, and I think they are all correct because this is really, I mean, all these are import, provide important information on what is the controlling factor of a behavior. But what is also needed also is some studies that would bridge these different levels here. And this is what I would like to present today. So today I will present uh, studies uh, in the domain of uh, cognitive psychology. I am a cognitive psychologist and I'm doing comparative studies with non-human primates. I'm doing studies, behavioral studies with baboons. So I want firstly to address a question which is what are the main properties of their cognitive system, of the cognitive system of baboons? And to do that, I will present some experiments that we did in the lab, and that explore different aspects of their cognitive system. So we did some experiments that I will present on attention, on short-term memory, on long-term memory, on abstract reasoning. I want to present that just to, to have a, an overview of what they can do, what they cannot do, how do they differ from humans? And then, 
I will try to bridge the gap between at least two levels of analysis. So I will try to present two studies where we try to relate these two domains, which is the domain of social cognition and non-social cognition. But first, I think I have to say something about my subject and the way I'm testing this subject in my laboratory. So these are the animals I'm working with. I'm working with baboons in Marseille, in a primate center in Marseille. So these are the Guinea baboons. I don't know if you are familiar with primates, non-human primates, but these animals actually originate from the west part of Africa, here from Senegal. They are mostly savanna animals, and uh, they belong to the group of old world monkeys. And, uh, the, the group of old world monkeys is a big group of uh, monkeys. There are many monkeys in this group, including the macaques that we have seen before. But it belongs to this group, and about 25 million years separate the lineage going from to old world monkeys and humans. So now, the way of testing them. Uh, if you come to my lab, you will see this. So this is a, the view of the outside of my lab. So I'm working with a group of baboons, 30 baboons. These baboons live in an enclosure like this one. So this is a space, a large space, and they just have a free life within this enclosure. So they can do whatever they want, but one thing that they can do is that they can enter one of, of these trailers that are just there. So there are some access here that they can use, and they can go there. And when they enter these trainers, we will find this. And these are a series of operant conditioning test systems. In other words, there are systems, here there are five within each trailer, and these systems are just organized this way. So the animal is coming inside the test cage here, just freely, I don't have to capture it. Then it has in front of it a touch screen here, and we use the touch screen to present the stimuli and to record the response to the, to the task. And the animal has a microchip here in each arm, so the computer will just know who is coming in the, computer, in the uh, test cage and uh, what is the animal, and, and the computer will adapt the task to the identity of the subject. So this is a short video showing how it works. Uh, okay, you have here a view of the baboons inside their enclosure, so they're just free. And one thing they can do, they can enter the trailer, just freely, and then when they are inside the test cage here, the computer will recognize the individual. The animal is just looking at the screen, and we, we present some experiments on the screen. So this is a memory task here, and then the animal will have to solve the task, and if he does it, then he gets a reward. Okay? So what are the advantages of this setup? So at least there are at least two advantages of this setup. The very first one is that this setup seems, seem, seems to be good for the animal. So what we have done here, we have recorded the saliva level, uh, the cortisol level in, within the saliva. And we have shown that there is a lower level of cortisol within the sal saliva when these animals are using the test system. So this suggests that this, is, this seems to improve their, at least reduce the stress. And another advantage of a system is that, okay, we can collect huge database. We can collect many, many trials. On average, each animal makes 1,900 trials a day, okay? So that means that within, with the system, we can collect from 25 to 30 trials a day at the group level. And, and this works seven days a week. So we have large database, we have many data, and we can use this data just to to, 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 to get some information on their cognitive system. Okay, let's now explore the cognitive properties, the properties of their cognitive system. And I wa want to firstly present an experiment we did on attention. In humans, there is an effect which is well known, which is called global precedence. This is a very old phenomenon which is known in the human psychology. Okay, if I present you this kind of stimuli, and ask you to, to judge the large shape or a smaller shape, there is one situation which is easier, which is the global shape. I mean, so if I ask you, what, what do you see here? I mean, it will be easy for you to just to say, I've seen the large shape. But if you have to judge the small shape, then it will take a longer time. And from that, Nevon proposed that probably vision and attention goes from global to local. There is some direction in the attentional process. We tested that in monkeys. 
and we use this kind of hierarchical stimuli. So we just present a sample stimulus to the monkey. And then we say, okay, please touch this stimulus here. And then the monkey touch the stimulus, and then we present two. And the monkey has to select the one that goes with the previous stimulus. So, and obviously this is this one here, because this one has the same global shape as that one here. And the animal has to touch it, and when he says that, he says, okay, this is a global match. There is a similarity at a global level. But you can do the same thing for, uh, for local trials. So the animals will have to select one of these two. It will be this one, because now this is a local match. There is a similarity at the local level. We do the experiments on humans. We do the experiments on baboons. These are the results on humans. You can see that humans replicate global precedents. So they are better for global trials. We don't see the legend here, but they are better for global trials, and they are faster for global trials in comparison to the local ones. What about baboons? Well, we just get the opposite effect. Baboons are better at the local level. So this kind of trial is, is easier for them than that one. So they are actually better at the local level. Local for local trials and also faster for these local trials. So that suggests that there is at least probably an attentional difference here between humans and animals. Uh, this baboons here seems to be more global. And this effect has been replicated many times. So it was replicated in my lab, for instance, using hierarchical figures of different kinds and using different, uh, different kind of um, uh, procedures. It has been replicated with compound stimuli. It has been replicated with schematic faces. And other labs also showed the same effect, for instance, in pigeons. Yeah, for my colleagues in uh, Tufts University just published that on pigeons also. And there is a, now probably 10 or 15 papers just replicating this effect in uh, capuchins. So there is probably a real difference between human and uh, non-human primates and even birds, uh, considering the way it seems to process this kind of stimuli. This could have some functional uh, consequences. So we can, for instance, train the monkey to, say, to, to see the stimuli, and we can tell the monkey, look at the stimuli. Do they show the relation of sameness or differentness? And the monkey can do that. But if we increase the distance between the two bars, then the performance will decline. The perf why, 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 does it, why, why does it decline? It probably declines because the animal have really, have really, really attained the focal level of the stimulus. If you pay too strong attention to the detail, then you don't see the relation between things. And this is probably a difference, a functional difference between the two species. We did also some experiments on the short-term memory. And to do that, we uh, did ex use a procedure which is called the Corsi test. And this is the test. You firstly present one stimulus, one, squ one square on the screen. And then you leave a square on the screen, and then you present a second one. And you, then you leave these two on the screen, and then you present a third one. And then they all disappear from the screen, and then they all come back together. And the animal has to touch them in the same order as they have appeared during the first phase of a trial. Okay? So the animal has to replicate the order. And then if he does that correctly, he gets a reward, otherwise he gets a punishment. So we can do that, we did that on, on baboons, and when we do that on baboons, we can manipulate the length of a sequence. So we can make a series of three items, we can make a series of four items, five items, six items. And this is the performance of a baboon with this different length. When we use three items in this, this kind of trial, the animal is quite good, 70% correct. When we use four items, it is well, well above chance, because chance is really low in this experiment, but it is only 25% correct. When we use five items, now it is at chance level. How does it compare to humans? Well, this is the results for humans. So humans are much better here. Humans can be very good up to six items, and we know that they can go farther here. They can even go use longer sequences. So there are some real differences here in the size of a short-term memory, probably. And I think that, again, this difference must have some functional con uh, consequences, because a short-term memory is a kind of bottleneck. This is a system that you will use just to have some information and to pass it to the working memory system, to, le, to, to the long-term memory system. So if you have a short-term memory, limited short-term memory, probably you are limited in your cognitive system. We did experiments on long-term memory. 
And this is the experiment. This experiment lasted three years. This is the task. We take a huge number of different pictures, a huge number of different pictures, and then we select one of them. And then we present this picture on the screen, and the animal has to touch it. And once the animal has touched it, then we present two possible stimuli that the animal has to select. And the animal has to learn that this given picture goes with this given response. And before the experiments, we just predefined the fact that it should go this way. This should go with that. There is no reason for that. Which is, this is just arbitrary association. Okay? And then the animal has to learn that this picture goes with that one, another one will go with a circle, another one will go with a circle again, and, and so on, and so on, and so on, and then we expand. We expand the number of the images that the animals have to learn. And we did this experiment during three years. Every day we try to expand the number of images that the animals had to learn. And what you will have here, and we, we did so just to test the limit of their long-term memory capacity, but as well as to test their, the durability of their memory. When we do that, we did actually this experiment with pigeons, but please forget the pigeon from, for the timing. But just have a look at the result from baboons here. What you have here is a percentage correct of the baboons we have tested, depending on the number of images that they have learned. Okay? And you can see that these baboons here could learn 6,000 different pictures. So they have learned 6,000 different associations between a picture and one of these two responses. Okay? This is an amazing number of pictures that they can remember. What about the durability of this? We didn't really record the durability, but what we can do in this experiment, we can just consider the lag. What is the lag? This is the number of trials in between two trials using the same image. Okay, you can have an image presented to the, in the, scre to the screen, on the screen, and then you, you pre the animal will, will answer this, uh, this, this trial, and then you will have many different other trials using other image, and then this image will come back again. This first image will come back again. And what is the effect of this lag here? You can see that the performance will drop slightly even if you have more than 50,000 uh, 50, trials in between two presentations of the same image. Okay, they have an amazing durability of their memory, long-term memory. And this can be estimated in our study by about one year. So probably the animal can just see a picture, answer to a picture. If it doesn't see the picture during one year, probably it will know after one year what is the correct response to a picture. How does it compare to humans? We didn't test humans. But this paper was published in 2006, and one colleague from Joel Voss from Northwestern University actually just replicated the experiments on himself. Just trying to have some idea of what is, again, the size of the memory system, the long-term memory system, and uh, the durability of the, of the memory. So he did the experiment on himself, and this is the results he published in terms of uh, images, number of images that he could retain. You can see that this human could retain 5,000 images, so it's slightly less than baboons. So he was 60% correct or 65% correct with 5,000 images. Baboons are slightly better here. And they could even remember more images. So what, which story should we make from this? I don't know. I think we have to be cautious here. There is only a single subject here, but probably we can safely just say that, OK, both humans and baboons have amazing capacity just to store information in the long run. OK? What about the durability for humans? Well, they are just exactly the same. We have exactly the same slope for humans as for baboons, so there are some similarities, at least regarding durability of the memory system. Okay, reasoning now, abstract reasoning. It's really interesting to study the ability for abstract reasoning in non-human primates because it addresses this question. What is the relation between abstract thought and language? Some people think that you need language to, do some, to have some complex forms of abstract reasoning, and some other people think that this is not necessary. It's probably not fully necessary. And this is just for an example here. 
For instance, you can, and, and Martin has shown that this morning on bees, you can train also different species of other animals on the, uh, to just to, say, to tell the difference between sameness or differentness. And this experiment was published by a colleague, Tony Wright. And this is the experiment. You, you firstly see your first picture, and then you see another one. And if you, the second one is the same as the first one, then you just touch the second picture, and that means they are identical. But there are some different trials. You firstly see a first picture, and then you see another one. It is different. And in that case, you have to touch this square here. And the, uh, the, cap the rhesus monkeys, the capuchin, the pigeons here, can learn this task easily. Burns can do, um, bees can do that, apparently, too. And uh, they can do that first with pictures that have been used during training, but also with new pictures that have never been presented before, suggesting that they have some ability for abstractness. But this is still somewhat easy. This is another task which is even more, much more difficult. This is the so-called relational matching task. So consider this task. Here I show you two stimuli. I will call them AA. Okay. In that case, there are two identical stimuli. So that shows, that pair shows the relation of sameness. So the animal will see this pair here, and then it will see, it will see, it will see two other pairs. One of these pairs all show the relation of sameness, but with different stimuli. And this pair show the relation of differentness. And now the animal has to match this pair with that pair because they show the same relation. So what they do have to do in that case, they have to discriminate relations and to match them. They have to match relation with relations. They have to associate relations together. And in that case, obviously, the subject has to select the BB pair because it shows the same relation as the AA pair. Or, but there are also the different trials. We have to select the AB pair because the DE pair because it shows the relation of differentness, just like that one. Okay? So we have been able to demonstrate that the baboons can do that. They can solve this task. It takes a long time to learn. It takes about 30,000 trials for some of them. Some are faster, actually. But still, by the end of the training, they will do that. And this is a short video showing the performance. Okay, this is a different. It goes to different on the right. This is same, it goes to same on the left. Same again, same on the left again. Different on the left. Same, left, next one will be on the right. Same on the right. Okay, this is the behavior that we... This is Amazingly complex task for, for animals. How, how do actually children deal with a task? This experiment was done also with children. It was done by Deirdre Gantner and Christie, published in Cognitive Science some years ago. And this is the same task. You, you see two stimuli and you have to match the, uh, this pair with another pair depending on the relation, the mapping of the relation. And Deirdre Gantner used two kind of um, test trials. In some trials, she provided a label to the subject. She said, okay, this is a trophet. Could you find the other trophet? And when she did so, she could demonstrate that the young kids at two years old could solve the task, at three years old and even at four years old. But baboons don't have labels here. And this is comparable to what humans do, children do, when they don't have any labels. Could you find the match? And when you ask the young children, could you find the match? It takes four years to be able to do that. So that seems to solve a task that a four years old children can do. Okay, so these are just first conclusions. These animals have a very efficient cognitive system with many similarities with humans, obviously, including some abilities for abstract reasoning, but also differences regarding at least attentional mechanisms. I'm referring to the experiments on global local but also uh, make uh, short-term memory, I'm referring to experiments on the Corsi test. So now let's move to the other part of my talk, which is on the relation between social cognition and non-social cognition. 
One of the main interests of my lab is that the baboons are always in a social context. They are always in a social context. First, they live in a social group. They have their daily life within the group here. And sometimes they just quit the group to go inside the box to be tested, but still, I mean, they are in the social context. But they are also in a social context where, when they are in the operant conditioning test system. So this short video will show that. If here you will see a short video showing that this animal is working in parallel with that one, which is working in parallel with that one, working in parallel with this one and this one. And this animal here can see the other one here or the other one here. So when they are tested, they are in a social context. Okay? So that means that in this lab here, we can do experiments on non-social cognition. We can do as well studies on social cognition, also try to investigate the relation between these two. Here is one experiment that we did recently. Not recently, three years ago, four years ago. In this experiment, this is an experiment on attention, and this experiment is relatively easy for the monkey, for the baboon. You, hide, you have to find a target, and the target is a T-shaped platter here. So there are some destructors here, and there is a target here. So once you have seen the target, you have to touch it. And there are two conditions in this experiment. Which, the first one is a predictive condition, and the other one is a non-predictive condition. In the predictive condition, the location of the destructors will tell you where the target is. Because whenever you will have this given background, the target will, will always be at a given location. So these two levels, background or the location of a target, are correlated. In the non-predictive condition, there is no map at all, no mapping at all between the location of a target and the location, the, the structure of a background. So we propose this experiment to the baboons. But when we did the experiments, we can also have a look at what the animals are doing inside the enclosure. So let's have a look at this. You will see a short interaction between individuals. Oops, not that one. I move back. OK. These are social interactions here. OK, you can feel the stress here. This is, there are many agonistic behaviors. But after this behavior, Okay, this individual will go inside the trailer. And he does some trials. So I collect some information in this context here. And you can compare this video to the next one. And what this individual is doing now is a presentation. This is a real gentle behavior. Right? So meaning, okay, I'm okay, I'm good. Don't worry, I don't want to fight. I don't want any fight. So I'm just showing you. Uh, my body, and then, once I've done that, okay, I will quietly go inside the trailer, and once I'm in the trailer, I'm recording the behavior of the in individual inside the task, in the task. So this is what we did. We recorded the social events when they occurred inside the enclosure. Then we saw them as being posi uh, socially positive or negative events, and then we analyzed the performance in the computerized task, depending on what they have done during the three minutes before the trials, okay? And when we do that, we will have a nice result of this kind, so there is no interaction, but basically what these results show is that there is a main effect of predictive condition when the background predicts the location of a target, the animals are faster. This is just normal, they use the background. But there is an effect of a mood, social mood. And when the animal had a negative inter social interaction prior to the trial, their response time, their response time is higher. Okay? And what does it suggest? It probably suggests that okay, there are different a pathway by which social context can affect the cognitive performance. I mean, the social context will affect the emotional state of a subject. And this, in turn, will affect the cognitive performance in the main task because of variation in the emotional state. But there is another mechanism, another potential mechanism in that, and this is it. Okay, let's consider that social context require, processing the social context requires some executive control. If you are a baboon in a social group, there are many things that you cannot do. 
There are some female that you cannot approach. This is forbidden. This is prohibited. You cannot go there. This is forbidden. You shouldn't do that. There are some behaviors you, that you shouldn't do. So you need some control if you want to survive in a social group in a baboon. But when I propose a task in my computer, this also requires some executive control. So for instance, I can propose a task where the animal has to control itself, to stop a behavior, for instance. And this also will, will uh, use some executive control system, the, the, the executive control system. And probably there is a competition between these two. And this competition could make that the social context can affect the cognitive performance. So we tested this idea with my colleague um, uh, Pascal Huguet from, uh, from my lab in Marseille. And this is the experiment that we have done. This is a Simon-like task. And this is the training condition. In the training condition, we present a sample stimulus and then two response stimuli. If the sample stimulus is this kind of shape, a parallelogram, then you have to select the square, which is always on the right part of the screen. If a sample stimulus is a circle, then you have to select the cross, which is always on the left part of the screen. And the animals can learn that, so they, they are trained on that. So if you see a parallelogram, you select the square. If you see a circle, you select the cross. And this is the training condition in which the animals have been trained on overtrained. And then we propose two kinds of trials. The first kind of trial, it just, we call it the dominant trial because they are just the same as in training. This is the kind of tri trial that the animals know very well. But we also propose the conflict trials. They are just the same as in training, except that now we shift the location of the response stimuli. So now, if you see, I don't remember the mapping, but if you see the circle, then you also always have to select the cross, but now it's not on the left anymore, it is on the right. So you have to control yourself to be correct in this task. So there are two levels of processing here, one that requires executive control, and that one that is probably more automatic because of the huge training that they received on this task. But we need also to manipulate the social context. And if you come to the lab, you will see this. Sometimes within the trailer, there is only one single animal within the five boxes here. But sometimes there are two, sometimes there are three, four, three again. So there is a flow. It's moving. It's changing. So we have different social contexts, just naturally. And so we have different social contexts. We have two test conditions differing in the need for executive control. So we can assess the effect of a social context on executive control. What you will have on this graph are the response times of the subject, depending on the type of, the kind of, tri the type of trials, dominant trials or non-dominant trials. We have, in this graph, organized the trials by bins. These trials here are the trials in which the animal was quick to respond. These trials here are the trials in which the animal was slow for responding. And we had the idea that if you have an effect of a social context, it should appear here because executive control takes some time. So the data will be represented this way. Each dot corresponds to a social context. Here, the animal is alone in the trailer. Here, there is one other individual in the trailer. Here, there are two. Here, there are three. So you see that in this kind of trial here, there is no effect of a social context. But you can see as well that the non-dominant trials, when the animal has to control itself, takes time because the response time are slower in comparison to the dominant trials. So what is happening when we move in the distribution of the response time? When we do that, we will see that something will occur. And we will see that when the animal takes some time, and when it has to control itself, it is it, it has some problems when we increase the size of a social context, OK? And this, I think, suggests that the social context takes some executive resources that the animal cannot use anymore to solve the non-dominant trials. We had other evidence for that. For instance, consider these two kind of trials, these sequences of two trials. You can have a non-dominant trial preceded by a non-dominant trial. 
If you can control yourself, you will take advantage of this trial to adapt your behavior in the next trial, and your response time should be faster in comparison to this kind of situation where the non-dominant trial is preceded by a dominant trial. And this is true. This is what we observe here. We get a difference between these two conditions, but only when the animal is alone. When there is more individual inside the trailer, then we don't get this effect anymore, we just get the opposite effect. And I think this suggests that there is another way by which the social context will affect the cognitive performance. This is that there is a competition between the processing in terms of executive control required by the processing of a social context and the processing of a main task. So I am done here, I want to conclude now. So my conclusion will be easy and straightforward. Non-human animals seem interesting models to study the relation between cognition and behavior. And we have now very efficient experimental tools to study this relation here. And with these new tools, I mean, we can collect an extensive, extensive data, extensive large sets on the cognitive performance. And we can as well more easily bridge the different level of analysis. And we, when we try to do that, we can show that there is a complex network of interaction among factors. So obviously, the behavior is in part controlled by the outcome. If in my lab I turn the dispenser off, the animal will stop working, obviously. So the behavior is in part controlled by uh, the outcome of the behavior. But the behavior is as well controlled by the cognitive system, and now we know a lot on many aspects of the animal's cognitive system, in that case, on baboons. We know a lot on their attention, we know a lot on their executive control system. I didn't present that today. We know a lot on their memory, on their short-term memory, on their working memory system. We don't, I have not presented that today. We know a lot on their reasoning abilities and so on. And all this can be used to explain some aspect of the behavior, but this is not enough. And if you want to have a broader understanding of the behavior and what, what is controlling the behavior, we need also to probably consider to some, at some level the effect of a social context for social animals. And what I've tried to show is that there are many different pathways by which the social context can affect the cognitive system, which can in turn affect the behavior and how the behavior depends on the outcome. So thank you.